is not a distraction at all. That's a sign of health. That is a good thing. I love hearing that. So we're in Esther chapter 9 this morning in our progress through the book of Esther. And those of you that have been here with us through this, this has been a, a, a fun study. Uh, we're actually finishing a couple weeks earlier than I expected, which is very good. And uh, so we're looking forward to what we have next week and the weeks to follow. Um, but today, Lord willing, we will finish up the book of Esther. So this story of Esther, um, as we've said before, is, has everything in it that you would uh, think of great literature or at a Shakespearean level, that it has politics and war and betrayal and romance, it has political corruption, it has this invisible, unsung hero. And one more literary feature that we're going to see today that happens to be one of my favorite literary features is puns. And we know what a pun is, right? It's when there's something that's kind of, kind of a, you know, you punish people with it, you know? Um, it's really punny. Um, no, it's when there's kind of a double meaning to something. And you, and you kind of, you know, it's like, uh, uh, I saw one re this week, this guy says, hey, um, I, I, I'm raising, I have some calves on my ranch. I'm really raising the steaks, yeah? And then one guy says, was that a beef joke? And if it was, it was well done. <laughs> you know, those are some puns where there's a double meaning. We're going to see in Esther chapter 9 a double meaning that has meaning for us today and is something the Jews still celebrate and has application to us as believers, as Christians as well. And so we're going to look in verses chapter 9, verses 1 to 19, and we're going to see some things about God's word and a realized victory. And then in then chapter, chapter 9, verse 20 through chapter 10, there's only three verses in chapter 10, we'll see what came about because of God's deliverance. And so let's look in chapter 9. We'll read verses 1 to 19, and then we'll ask God to help us as we dive in. Let's look at, the, look at God's word. This is what God's word says. This is Holy Scripture. Now in the twelfth month, month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay, lay hands on those who sought to their harm, and no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples. And all the officials of the provinces, and all the satraps, and the governors, and the royal agents also helped the Jews, for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. And in Susa, the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and also killed Perjadatha and Depthon, Ashbatha and Portha and Adaliah and Eridatha, and Perishtha, and Erisai, and Eridai, and Vashtha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, but they laid no hand on the plunder. The very day the number of those killed in Susa, the citadel, was reported to the king, and the king said to Queen Esther, in Susa the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men, also the 10 sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the provinces? Now what is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's edict. And let the 10 sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. And so the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa 
gathered also on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they killed 300 men in Susa. And they laid no hands on the plunder. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them. But they laid no hands on the plunder. And this was the 13th day of the month of Adar. And on the 14th day they rested and made that a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the 13th day and on the 14th day and rested on the 15th day, making that a day of feasting and gladness. And therefore the Jews of the villages who live in the royal towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day for gladness and feasting, as a hol holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts of food to one another. This is God's word. Let's ask God to help us. Father, we want to be faithful to your word, so we ask your help by your spirit now. And apply it, please, Lord, as you would wish. Lord, you are the preacher, and would you take your words and do what this human's voice cannot do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is uh, definitely one of those passages of Scripture that, if it were an episode on TV, would have the V for violence uh, warning us about it. So we see in verse 1 the outcome of the conflict. Now, when you see this, this is actually somewhat anticlimactic because this reversal really happened back in chapter 8 when Mordecai had issued this second decree out. And this was, they knew this was going to happen, so it was really kind of just making real what had already been finalized, a kind of um, realizing or expecting. It was already a done deal. The decree for the survival of God's covenant people had already been given, so you really kind of could have ended the story there. So why did they wait these months for the 13th day um, of Adar? Now, this is the 12th month, so about February, beginning of March in our Julian calendar. And, so, and it says in verse 2 that no one could stand against them. Verses 3 and 4 tell us about Mordecai's fame. So Mordecai's gone from being this hidden figure to being this really kind of titan of power in the kingdom. And then verses 6 to not 10 tell us about this killing that happened, that verse 6 tells us of these 500 men in Susa, and then listed the names that I had a hard time pronouncing of the ten sons of Haman. Actually, Jewish tradition, I read one place this week that in the Megillah, that when they read this on Purim, that, that they're supposed to try to say all the ten sons of Haman in one breath, so that you, we're not even going to waste our breath on them. We're just going to one breath on, on those ten guys. And so it tells us of these ten sons. Um, and you think, that's kind of, whoo, they, they, they're killed, and then they're hung. They're kind of displayed, kind of impaled out on these gallows. Um, that, that when this leader was killed in the family, and re, and, and then, but then there's a couple different things that happen. There's a couple things I want you to note that are repeated. So you would notice that three times in this portion that we read, in verse 10, it said that they laid no hand on the plunder. And then in verse 15, it would said, but they laid no hands on the plunder. And then in verse 16, it says again the third time, but they laid no hands on the plunder. Why is that mentioned three times? Last week, we had talked about how this was, in a sense, a holy war, that what Mordecai was declaring in this decree was fulfilling what his ancestors had failed to fulfill in, with Saul in the extermination of the Amalekites that had been told to the Jews in Exodus to do, explained for them in Deuteronomy to do, and then Saul disobeyed by letting King um, um, Elimelech um, not die and taking of plunder. Now, so because this was holy war, they were told not to take any of the goods this is repeated in other places in the Bible. By holy war means God had told them to do this. You'll probably remember from Sunday school or vacation Bible school the story of Jericho and how when they walked around Jericho and the wall, they, were, they weren't supposed to take anything from Jericho. 
couple reasons. One was to picture the idea of first fruits. God gives us something, the first fruits we give a portion back to him. That principle is standard in the Bible for both testaments. We give a first fruits to the Lord. And then, but they weren't supposed to do that because God had told them to do this. And you probably know a story in the Old Testament of someone who didn't do that and it really messed everything up, right? Achan. Remember, Achan took the things and hid them in his tent. They buried them. And it was there. They were looking for that Achan in the camp. And we use that phrase even today when there's someone in the midst that's um, not doing, didn't do what they were told to do. So that's something that we see in this text, uh, emphasizing this idea of holy war. The other thing kind of brings up some questions for us. Because Disney kind of princessized Esther for us. And Esther makes some requests here that you're kind of like, they're not really ladylike, you know? Oh, you only killed 75,000 guys and 500 here? Give me another day, right? Oh, they're already dead? Put them on the gallows. Display them out there. And you're like, wow, Esther. By the way, in 1913, I think, when they did an opera on this, they kind of left that part out. And when they did the movie about this, uh, they, they kind of, you know, that's the part we kind of... And, you know, as I read this week... Um, no one really defends her. Like, whether you're a liberal, whether you're Jewish, or conservative Christian commentators, no one really defends Esther in this. Um, some call her deceitful and a bloodthirsty woman. I mean, since I mentioned puns earlier, this is literally the definition of overkill. Like, they kill, do it again. You know? um, and the author makes no excuse to attempt to defend her. And any attempt by us to try to defend her in this is really just speculation. We're just guessing. We don't know why. Um, And and if you have a study Bible with a reason why, that's just that person's guess, right? Um, And um, and, and as I said, almost universally, everyone agrees that this is set in negative terms. But you know, so then why would God give us that in the Bible, that little episode there about Esther? And I think it's one of the things that actually speak to the testimony of the truthfulness of the Bible, that the Bible, um, if this were just a made-up story, the facts would kind of make it like a nice little story to explain the origin of a holiday and leave out the bad stuff of the heroine. Usually when you try to tell a story, You don't try to paint the hero or the heroine in bad light in any way. Um, And this is, but the Bible doesn't do that. You think the Bible also reveals the darker side of many of God's servants. Peter, not just preaching at Pentecost and leading the early church, but denying the Lord three times. David, the man after God's own heart, but showing his sinfulness of adultery and murder. The Bible is very transparent, and I'm so thankful for that because God loves to use imperfect servants. Um, Humans are not worthy, but Jesus is. And so the killing keeps going on, and Haman's Haman's sons are hung. Now, this is also a little reaping what they've sown because when remember they had done this the Amalekites had done this to the sons of Saul Jonathan being one the friend of David so there's a reaping what one has sown there and 300 more men are killed in Susa on the 14th day and then verse 16 to the end of that section gives us the report from the rural areas where there's 75,000 more have been killed this this um and then verses 17 and 19 explain the differences in the feast days that those that were in the country celebrated just on the 13th but those that were in the city uh the of susa they needed that second day and there's a little shout out that the country folks were able to get it all done in one day and not the city folks they needed an extra one just a joke it's not in the text um, now, the rest of the chapter in the chapter in the verse chapter 10 gives us this picture of this celebration and why they do this. So the total body count here, we have 810 in Susa, 75,000 of provinces. This is a huge amount of people that are dead. 
Um, I mean, think about it, that's almost close to the entire like normal off-season population of Cape May County. That's, that's a huge amount of people that are exterminated here. And now there's some principles. I mentioned that the Jews didn't take the, spoil, the spoils, that that's part of that holy war thing. I mentioned that earlier. Also, this had already been decreed. Here's a picture for us, I think. This, this victory had already been decreed in, with what Mordecai had said. They were just waiting on it to be realized. There's a little picture of that that when we go to the end of this book in Revelation, we already see that the decree has been done and that Christ wins. And we're just waiting on that to come to, to fruition. Um, and then where is God in all this? That Israel in Esther is connected to this same covenant people in the Old Testament. Neither Esther nor Mordecai are described as devout Jews. There's no mention that the Spirit of God came upon them like a prophet or like Samson or anything like that. Neither of them ever mention God. And as far as we know, they are indifferent to the covenant God made with their forefathers. Neither live lives of consistent obedience with the covenant. Um, they change. They make some great identity changes, identifying with God's people in the covenant. But they're imperfect people. So, so this story of Esther as a lesson for us, should ground our faith about God when we are in crisis. That when we're in crisis, and it doesn't seem like God's anywhere, He's still in control. So maybe you're going through a crisis. Maybe you've been through a crisis. That when it doesn't seem like God's anywhere, He is still in control. He is the invisible mover. Um, and if we're honest, the way that they're experiencing God in Esther's day is the way we experience God mostly today. It teaches us, as I mentioned last week, about the providence of God. That God's way of preserving His covenant was not like we read in other places, not through a miracle, the separating of a sea or plagues or a great spiritual revival as people. In fact, it was through this long sequence of improbable and even morally questionable events, even something as Mundane as one guy's insomnia to bring about this. One of my favorite commentators on the book of Esther, Karen Jubbs, she said it this way, here's a quote. The book of Esther is the most true-to-life biblical example of God's providence precisely because God seems absent. This is this great example of God's providence. And so, um, and so there's, there's not anything like spectacular about the way things pan out. Even Esther's involved in this political manipulation, uh, just like everyone else. And so even without a leader of high moral standards or exemplary character, God's promises are not changed. God uses these, his providence. He governs all things. And so this really is for one of the big lessons of Esther for us, that God directs the flow of human history through ordinary events. Ordinary events in the lives of individuals. He does this to fulfill his covenant. And you know, I'm glad for that, because that's where, where we live, in the mundane. The getting up, being tired because you lost an hour of sleep, going to doctor's appointments, picking up this, picking up the groceries, fixing this, calling someone to repair this, punching the clock again, doing another project, and that, to know that in the midst of all the mundane, God is there, and there's nothing by chance. Our God's so great, so powerful, and so magnificent that he doesn't need to move mountains. He can just use normal means. Um, and so God spares this entire race of people from genocide with one sleepless night by a wicked man. And so, God works providence in the ordinary events of your life too. The tiny miracles of providence direct our steps. I want you to think about the circumstances in life that led to you becoming a Christian, to your conversion. Some people would, that maybe, how many people were saved before you were like 18 years old? You, okay, that's, that, and that's the statistics. That, that, that's why children's ministry and youth ministry is so important. How many people were saved in, in your 30s? 
How about in your 20s? You got someone in their 20s? 40s? Is someone in their 40s? Anyone saved in their 50s? Anyone saved in their 60s? Okay. Uh, maybe I shouldn't go any higher, right? <laughs> 80s, 70s, higher? Okay, okay. All right. Anyone saved in their 90s? Okay. I don't think you can go higher. Okay. Um, think about the circumstances when you, those of you that were saved as a young person, maybe they were something as simple as my parents or grandparents took me to vacation Bible school. Um, and you know what? Sometimes we, when, you, when you're saved as a young person, you, you might think that you don't have an exciting testimony. You know, you weren't like driving down the road one day and then Tom Cruise was doing a stunt scene and it sloshed your jugular vein and you happened to have a nickel in the ashtray so you stuck it there and you drove to the hospital by yourself. And then there happened to be um, Ray Comfort was there and he witnessed to you and that's how you got saved, right? You know? Uh, you don't, you're like, I, you know, I don't have this ex exciting, you know, I just got done with the drug cartel, and then, um, and then I saw a track wadded up in my, in my ammo bag, and, and I, I read it, and I got saved, and then I walked out, and, you know, and, and sometimes we think, well, I wish I had one of those awesome testimonies, right? But how awesome of God that it is just as miraculous that you had a grandparent take you to vacation Bible school or a friend invite you to a youth activity and you only went because there'd be some cute boys there. But you heard the gospel of King Jesus and he drew you to himself and you believed upon him that God, like in Esther's day, uses these normal means and it is just as spectacular. Every soul being saved is a miracle of God's grace. And so, maybe you heard a preacher on the radio, or you got a request from a friend to go with them to church, or maybe it's how you met your spouse. Or think about the circumstances that led to your current job, the career, how you met your spouse. There are probably a lot of little things that you would think, well, those were just happenstance. No, those were all part of God's sovereign plan and Him working in providence. Um, now, but not all of those circumstances that God's worked for all those things in your life were good things, were they? There are some bad circumstances that have happened in your life. There are some ugly and heartbreaking and painful things. There have been sins committed against you. I'm not excusing those at all. I'm just saying that God is able to use even the evil things that humanity has brought about for his glory and his good. The death of a loved one, a serious illness, a wayward child, a broken relationship, a shattered dream, a failure in a job, or failure to pass a certain credential test or certification or something like that. All of those things, even if they're negative things, are all part of God's providence of bringing you and fulfilling his plan in your life. Esther's short story also shows us how God's word remains true and he can works, brings about his word to be fulfilled even without miracles. And that everything is part of God's redemptive plan. That all of history, including where we are right now, is part of this plan. He says he will be with us as we go make disciples of all nations, even to the end of the age. God is still working and calling people to this expected end. He's the one who's declared the end from the beginning, so we don't need to be skeptical about him. And I think this is also a reminder for us that our generation, just like the, so the generation of Mordecai and Esther are linked, even though they didn't realize it, to this great, grand, redemptive story that God had in this covenant with his people, that our generation is also linked to God's work in history. And our normal is part of this plan. There are no private histories that God has this huge plan that the best moments and our worst moments are all part of God's work in our lives. He has this covenant with his people and we are part of the new covenant. This is the only way we can face circumstances with hope. The Jews are spared from annihilation because of the ancient covenant God made with their ancestors at Sinai. We are spared from annihilation 
given hope and purpose in life because of a covenant with our mediator that he made on Mount Calvary, the covenant that Christ inaugurated, that we're part of that. And this is what gives us hope in the midst of all... Does, everything else doesn't make sense outside of that. So, unbeliever, are you part of that covenant? Haman's evil and the evil and all evil is, that des is destined with judgment. The bad news for people like me and you who are evil, that's bad news. But there's good news to those that know Jesus because they escape that judgment. And in Esther's day, you came into that covenant by identifying with God's people, the Jews. Today, you come into that covenant by entering into an identity with God's Son, Jesus. In fact, he says in 1 John, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. Those who are identified with him because of in, in his body, his bride, his church are, are identified with his people. So believer, do you find a treasure and a joy in that covenant? Um, Romans would tell us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake you're being killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ, which is in Christ Jesus, love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Esther shows us that the ordinary and insignificant, the minor, even the smallest events, are all part of how God works about his plan. Remember that these Jews weren't living in, in Jerusalem at the time. Others had. They were seeing these ordinary things. God was still at work. Then I want to go to the rest of the, the, the chapter, and let's read it together. Verse 20, it says, And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and the 15th day of the same year, same year by year. And as... The days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month that, that had been turned from them from sorrow into gladness, and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another, and gifts to the poor. And so the Jews accepted what they had started to do, and what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast pur, that is lots, to crush and to destroy them. But when it came before the king, he gave orders in writing that his evil plan that he had devised against the Jews should turn on his own head and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. And therefore they called these days Purim, after the term Pur. Therefore, because of all that was written in this letter and of that they had faced in this matter and of what had happened to them, the Jews firmly obliged themselves and their offspring and all who joined them that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written and at the time appointed every year and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation and every clan, province, and city that those days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor should the commemoration of these days cease among their descendants. The Queen Esther, the daughter of Am Abihail, and Mordecai the Jew gave full written authority confirming this second letter about Purim. Letters were sent to all the Jews in the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus in words of peace and truth that these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed seasons as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther obl obligated them. And as they had obligated themselves and their offspring with regard to their fasts and their lamenting, the command of Esther confirmed these practices of Purim and it was recorded in writing. King Ahasuerus imposed tax 
on the land and on the coastlands of the sea, and all the acts of his power and might and the full account of the high honor of Mordecai, to which the king advanced him, and they are not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia. For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus, and he was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers, for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. The first thing I'd like to observe as we finish this up is the role of women. This women, this, that Esther becomes this kind of partner with Mordecai. That the Bible gives us much more about the role of ladies in the congregation than sometimes is relegated to in discussion. Often it's just either part of motherhood or the other extreme of, you know, if we can't be ordained to clergy, then what else is there, right? Um, but this text reminds us that God has a plan of this, uh, that the family relationships and responsibilities that we have don't exhaust us from service to God. Luke would tell us that, I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. There's this partnership and God has a plan for everyone. He has good things prepared and works for us to be doing. Ladies, he has plans and works outside of the home for you to do. He's gifted all of us equally that we're joint heirs before Christ and heirs of the kingdom. And that the primary venue through which God has planned for us to exercise our spiritual gifts is in the body of Christ. And so serve and do that for God's glory. There's a partnership here. There's a picture of the priority, secondly, of the laity. You notice that there weren't any passages talking about how Mordecai or Esther were clergy or they were priests or they were scribes. That was what we were hearing about with Ezra and the scribes there and the priests back then over, over back in the land. But Mordecai and Esther both have secular jobs. And I say that with a little kind of scare quotes because for the Christian, there's no distinction between sacred and secular, that God is over everything, that he is Lord over Main Street and the church house. He is Lord over everything. There's not different sets of this. This is the priesthood of the believers, that we are all our own soul's priests. And one of the things that our forefathers in this country, the pilgrims and the Puritans, really emphasized was the, the, this biblical vision of vocation, vocation rather than a job. Because a vocation was part of a calling or a willing of God for you to use business or your, 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 whatever venue God has given you for work, for his glory, to use it to reach people. I mean, even in the book of Acts, when we get to Romans, Paul's writing to this church in Rome that he's never even been to. How did it start? Because there were probably presumably business people. They were like Lydia and those who were on trips, and they were the spearhead of the gospel to places. That there are places you can take the gospel, that Pastor George and I have no opportunity to take the gospel. This week, that God's put you in that place. There are people that you can interact with in, in your vocation, in your job, and where, the people in your family, the people you might visit, the people might come care, the, the people that you interact with, or just normal commerce. God has this calling for all of us. And, they, and we see this overly emphasized in the New Testament of this, this that we are all ministers. The, the, the work of the ministry is for all of God's children, all of the church. But the other thing that I want to point out, one more thing, is that God is sovereign. It's not just this secular and sacred in your life, but God is sovereign over secular history and redemptive history. One of the things that Esther has pointed out for us is not that there's, okay, there's the Bible stories of history and then there's secular history and that, that it is one and the same. All of history is truly, pun intended, his story. He is the Lord. He declares the end from the beginning. He is writing. He is the author of it all. And so God is sovereign over all of it. And we see in the end these last, this summary of God's provisions this spontaneous celebration that led to these organized feasts 
The dates are given, these gifts of food. It's kind of almost like our Christmas. And verses 23 to the end tell us about this, this feast of Purim. The first and last, this is the only non-Mosaic feast given in the Bible. Um, they added fasting and lamenting to the prescribed activity of Purim in verse 29. And once it's established, it's celebrated annually. It was celebrated this past week by our Jewish neighbors. There was a different way for those that lived in a walled city or outside a walled city. And it was named after Pur. This is where I said at the beginning that there's a little pun or a double meaning. This double entendre, this double meaning of the word. Pur means dice. And remember Haman casting the lot or the pur to determine the day in which the Jews would be exterminated. And they reverse this. Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast in lap, but everything, but it's every ruling is of the Lord. The lot refers to chance actions. That's where we get the word lottery, the chance. But the Bible, Esther gives us the example, the Bible explicitly states it in other places that the Lord determines, not chance. Psalm 16, 5 and 6, the Lord is my chosen portion. And my cup, you hold my lot. The lines have fallen from me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have beautiful inheritance. Lot means this double meaning. And only Yahweh determines destiny. Haman relied on fate. The roll of the dice to determine the lucky day that God, to exterminate God's people. But God reversed it. And he determined the destiny. Chapter 10 gives us Mordecai's rank and good rule. We've talked a little bit about how there's things found with similar names to Mordecai, even in the last century in archaeology. But what this tells us is that he, he is established, and there's this peace in Ahasuerus' kingdom. But this doesn't last for maybe another nine years. Ahasuerus is assassinated less than ten years later. And it reminds us that, as Revelation 11 tells us the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So it ends with this celebration of Purim. And what does it mean? One of my teachers, Dr. Bell, he said it this way. He said, it is appropriate to celebrate the victories of success in life. As believers, we have appropriately done this by giving thanks to God from whom all good things originate. That's a lesson for us from Esther. It is appropriate to celebrate the victories and the reversal of destinies that God has done. This word for feast or banquet occurs 20 times in the book of Esther. We saw it starting out in Esther, the feast that Ahasuerus is doing to consolidate his power and boast of his empire. Chapter 2, there's this celebration, this feast or banquet about Esther's ascension. In chapter 3, Haman joins the king in drinking with the same root of this word given about this feasting. In chapters not, 6 and 9, Esther gives two of these banquets or feasts trying to work with Ahasuerus to bring him this. The Jews, when the edict is read in chapter 8, they have this banquet or feast. And here in chapter 9, Purim, there's this banquet and feast. So they feast a lot. And the question is, what do we feast about? What we do we celebrate? And there's an application for us to be Purim people that we celebrate. We are tempted to live like the days of Esther without reference, reference to God. And if we look at what we feast out and what we celebrate, it'll show us what our priorities are and what our hopes are in. So Esther calls us to analyze what we feast and fast and what that shows about our hearts. What gets you down in despair? What gets you lifted up? How do you celebrate things like Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter? What makes it good? What makes, what, what, what's going to make it a good Easter in the next few weeks? Is it if you get certain foods or you have certain people and everybody's in the same room for the same dinner? 
I'm not saying any of these things are bad. Is it about making sure that the traditions are kept exactly the way you remember it? Sometimes the level of stress and domestic stress that comes upon us, especially times at like Christmas. You ever get stressed out at Christmas? Yeah? You ever get stressed out when you think about a family holiday? Yeah? Sometimes, not saying all, sometimes the stress level, because our emotions are like the lights on a dashboard of our soul, right? So your emotions, God uses our emotions. He points them to us. But see them like lights on your dashboard. What's, why am I upset about this? Why am I stressed out over this? And I think if we think about the stress that we feel around some holidays, it might show us some idolatries of our soul. That if we're so stressed about things being a certain way, or certain, so what makes it a great Easter season? If we celebrate and proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. Not that the roast comes out the exact way you wanted it to. Right? Now, I would be sad if it was burned, too. But the resurrection still happened either way. Um, so the reversal of destiny of God's people is celebrated annually. If that's done by the Jews, even this past week, how much more should we celebrate the greatest reversal that, that we being turned from darkness to light, from sinner to saint, from, the, from on our way to hell to on our way to heaven, from being en enemies of God to being sons and daughters of God. How much more? And we get to do that every Lord's Day. How do you feel about Sundays? I mean, every Sunday for a Christian is kind of a mix of Christmas, Thanksgiving, and Easter all together. We're thankful to the Lord. He's come, he died, he rose for us. In fact, the Puritans emphasize that every Lord's Day is this celebration. Every Lord's Day is an Easter. Every Lord's Day is a Thanksgiving. Every Lord's Day is a Christmas. Every Lord's Day, we celebrate the reversal and the future deliverance of our great God for us. And so, Esther tells us that without spectacular miracles, God does all this work. So who's the main character of the story of Esther? Well, if you were just reading the story without knowing, you'd see that the word king occurs 29 times. And it's mentioned 168 times. It seems like this king is in control. But he's manipulated by Mimukin. He's manipulated by Vashti. He's manipulated by Haman. He's manipulated by Esther. So is Haman the one who's in charge? Well, at first it seems like, wow, he's kind of getting it done, and the Jews are going to be exterminated. But then he's not as much as in charge as it, as it first appears. Because there's a hidden figure. And there was this hidden figure in Mordecai, a hidden figure in Esther, and a hidden figure in God. That God exercised his providence to preserve the Jews. So that his son would come one day to fulfill the law in your place, in my place, and our debt would be offered in this free gift of eternal life would be given to us. If you'll receive it. So Esther is perfect for us when we're in places and circumstances we don't like. And so I want to have three points and, and we're done, okay? Three points of application. Number one, this story is part of a bigger story. It tells how God keeps his promise to Abraham from his people. From his people would come the Messiah. Through the anointed one, Israel would be a blessing to all the nations. And because of Mordecai and Esther, Haman's plan to exterminate the Jews fails utterly. Other plans to exterminate Jews like Caesar Augustus fail utterly. Ones in the last century to exterminate the Jews fail utterly. They are failures. All the conspiracies of those wishing to thwart God's kingdom are linked in that failure. So when Jesus shows up in Jerusalem a few hundred years later, there are a lot of Jews there. And the Bible and God's kingdom marches on. Number two, Christians should read Esther not just as a story about the Jews, but as part of our heritage too. If this hadn't happened, there would be no fulfillment in Christ, no gospel no New Testament church. It's not just looking back at God's deliverance for the Jews, but looking forward to a greater deliverance that he has to come. 
Xerxes called himself the king of kings. Caesar called himself the savior of the world. He tried to use a census to bring about his power, but God used that to put Jesus in the right place. God took every bit of holy war on the cross to bring us together in the church. So think about this. Think about this. The, the, the enmity between the Jews and the Amalekites here in Esther. But in the church, in Jesus, holy war is done. And Amalekites and Jews are one in Christ. Jew, Gentile, Greek, barbarian, male, female, one in Christ. The descendants of Edom today and the descendants of Abraham today can be one in Christ. It's an incredible thought, incredible truth. This kingdom of Christ calls us to respond to this gospel and repent and believe it, to worship him. Next point, three. He calls you, he calls me to celebrate our deliverance. Esther ends the celebration of deliverance, the great reversal from death to life, from condemnation to glory. That's what Esther calls us to be like, to do, to be people of Purim, that we'd celebrate the deliverance we have in our lives. Let's do that together. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Let's just take a moment, and I want you to celebrate the deliverance that's happened in your life. Just take a few moments and thank God. I want you to think of your conversion. I want you to think of your conversion, the circumstances in your life that brought you about to it. And I want you to thank God for that. The invitation by a friend, a godly parent, a Christian school, a vacation Bible school program, a friend witnessing to you, a radio program. And celebrate and thank God for the deliverance he's put in your life. And the deliverance yet to come for all of Christ's kingdom. And if you can't celebrate that, today is part of that miraculous work of providence of God bringing you to a place to hear the gospel and we would plead with you and beg with you beg of you and in the name of Jesus say repent and believe the gospel Father we thank you for this book Lord help us to apply it help your spirit we ask your spirit to apply it to us in Jesus name Amen you stand with us as we sing our benediction, Aaron's blessing.